All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome and thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am Ryan Bright. I'm a, the co-owner of the Family Recovery Centers. Um, and I think a lot of you might know, but we are an intensive outpatient uh, program for adolescents and their families um, located in Lake Bluff, Hoffman Estates, and St. Charles. We accept most insurances um, and do work with people who are out of network or on a sliding scale basis. Um, we are an evening program. What kind of sets us apart, not kind of, but what actually does set us apart is that we require parent or guardian involvement two of the four nights per week where they're learning the DBT skills right alongside of their child. Um, additionally, we provide 24 hour on-call for in vivo skills coaching, not only for the teens, but as well as anyone in their support system, including their families and schools and et cetera. Additionally, we offer weekly DBT skills group at each of our locations. So um, that's it in a nutshell. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you guys have any questions or have need any additional information. Um, and without further ado, and since you guys definitely aren't here to listen to me talk, I'd like for you to, to introduce you guys to um, a longtime colleague and friend of mine, Paula Marucci. She is a LCSW and a CADC. She is the local EMDR trainer. Um, she does, spends half her time teaching um, and consulting and the other half working with clients specializing in complex trauma, substance abuse and addiction and dissociation. So Paula, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you again so much for coordinating and collaborating and being here today. Great, Ryan, thank you. Um, is there any way for me to see everybody or is it not set up that way? It is not, so it's just oh, okay. to see who it is. If you okay, I love to like see the facial expressions, but that's okay, all right. So, <laughs> um, but then maybe that's why Robert's here. So my name's Paula Marucci and I am owner um, and founder of EMDR Chicago. Um, I am an uh, LCSW and CADC, as Ryan said. Um, Ryan and I go way back, and I just have to do a huge shout out to the Adolescent Recovery Center um, just to share one personal piece. Um, Ryan is, uh, was the change agent in my family's life. Um, the work that they do is family oriented, and so like she said, you are sitting there along your child. And Ryan was the therapist that assisted with making a decision that I could never make that literally um, speaks to um, my child today who's doing fantastic in the relationship that I have with her. So it was very special for me to be asked by Ryan to come and speak um, EMDR. I'm very passionate about it. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but before I continue, I just want to introduce my um, colleague and um, coach, uh, Robert Manrique. He uh, has been a huge aspect of my journey that I've been on. I met him very early in my, my um, beginning years of EMDR and um, he's been fabulous. So Robert, if you wanna say a couple words, introduce yourself. Sure, uh, my name is Robert Menrique. I'm an LCSW. I have a private group practice that's been growing quite a bit the last year. Um, one of the reasons Paul and I think got together so early on is that we had such a passion. We shared the passion for EMDR and Paul has been able to support me as I've grown into uh, my, a role as an EMDR proof consultant. Um, in my work that Paula has introduced me to, I've been able to train nationally um, people with EMDR across the country, especially in Spanish speaking uh, populations, working in places like El Paso and uh, Texas and San Diego, just providing these trainings, which as, as we know, these are quite called for right now, given the times, especially. so. My focus with the MDR is working with couples, families, and groups. Um, that's many people are surprised that this kind of work or variations on it can be done with those groups. So I'm super excited to be here. Yay, thank you. And mm -hmm. so Robert's gonna be on the chat. If you have anything um, pressing that you need to ask, I am gonna try to make time for a Q&A at the end. I have a lot of material to present today, some um, fun videos so that we can uh, uh, reach everybody's different learning style, and then some of the resources that I'll be referring to. Robert, if you don't mind putting my um, website out, um, on my website, I have all my coaches um, and the tools that I'm working with my consultees with in my training. So really my website is more about a resource that goes out to those that are learning EMDR. But okay, let's get this party started. Once again, Paula Marucci, there I am. Um, and um, 
my story. How did I become an EMDR trainer, consultant, and therapist? Well, of course, we all have our own trauma uh, stories, and I have quite an extensive trauma story. And so um, when I, and I was, I was doing good, you know, uh, until I started having kids. And as my kids got older, it really started to activate and trigger a lot of the traumas that I had experienced. So I went into, I got into therapy in my thirties actually. And um, I love my therapist. She was fantastic. She's one of the best on the North shore. And we did not work with my trauma. We did not get in there and dig deep. And we did not rewrite the code that needed to be rewritten um, around how I perceived life and the lens that I was looking at life through, uh, which definitely affected my family. It affected me. So when I um, became a therapist, because it's my third career, um, and I was introduced to EMDR, the first thing I did was go get my own EMDR. And I was like, um, are you kidding me? Like, really? Like, this is what I needed to do? And so, I mean, I haven't stopped since then. I immediately got trained. I immediately, I was working at the Family Service Center in Wilmette. I had 35 clients. We started doing EMDR. My boss got everybody trained over there. Um, EMDR just was this like amazing tool that not for everybody, but that can really get in there and assist with rewriting the emotional code that is written for us, uh, for a lot of us um, at a very young age. So. Um, one of the reasons um, why I am so aggressive as of right now with my trainings is because the pandemic has uh, traumatized a lot of people. Um, and the tools that we offer in the training that Robert and I work, um, that we are training providers for, have um, five or six different tools that we offer. So in the old days, it used to just be EMDR, and now it's CID, ATIP, EMD, EMD little r, EMD big r. So the goal is you can meet your client where they're at, and you can contract with them what the work is going to look like. And then, of course, my passions are addiction and now also dissociation because dissociation is just super cool. That's all I can say about it at this point. Um, and it's a big buzzword, uh, too, because it's super cool. So I'm uh, like I said, I'm a trainer and I just had to play with one of the pages and show you one of my advertisements. We are so excited that we are getting back in person. Uh, I do trainings um, up in Sean or out in Schaumburg, up in Gurney. I've got one coming up in July. This is an example of my coaches. We have a great time. I've got um, 11 people working with me and they're all just super trained and ready to be a part of your journey because we're a family. We just don't train you and then dump you out on the side of the road and say, good, good luck, because some of uh, the trainings feel that way because it's a really intense tool that you're learning. Um, so so you need to learn it and then you need to have somebody be there for you as you um, apply it to your clients. So I told Brian, I gave her a very, very extensive list of objectives considering that this is two hours, but you can see I talk fast and I'm relatively organized. So we're gonna talk about the neurobiology of the memory because if you don't understand how the brain works and what memory, what's going on with memory and you just go and start putting your fingers up and move them around, uh, you're not gonna get very far because it needs to be um, encoded in you, in your memory networks uh, so that you can share your energy and your um, confidence in the work that you're doing with your uh, clients. You know, a lot of uh, this work is right brain work because it's about nonverbal communication. Um, I talk a lot and I was a great, well, still am a great talk therapist. But when we are working with our EMDR tools, we are not talking because the key to EMDR is that it is the natural healing process of the brain. And so if the brain is naturally healing, it doesn't need me talking to interrupt it. So that was like one of the first things I learned. Um, so anyway, back to our objectives. We're gonna talk about memory. We're gonna talk about the two types of um, uh, maladaptive memory uh, networks, which would be a PTSD or a CPTSD um, type of memory network. We're gonna talk about the action mechanisms. What are the agents of change that's going on with the MDR? It seems to be a mystery out there. And we can answer that question hopefully here in less than two hours. Um, Francine Sapiro is our um, founder, and I just have a little bit of her research in here. Um, I know a lot of people really want to know, like, does EMDR really work and if it's research-based? So I not, I'm spending a, a decent amount of time going into that because that's what people want to know. They want to make sure that they're not just going into, you know, something that's, that sounds magical or there's some kind of miracle. or It, it is a miracle. 
but it's an it's a miracle that is natural and it, like i said it's a natural healing process so we'll talk about that we're going to talk about clients that are appropriate for it because this is a tool that's going in your toolbox so it's not a tool for everybody but it is a tool that is um, widely used right now due to the uh, worldwide unprecedented pandemic that we have experienced and are still experiencing. Um, we're going to talk about how EMDR is eight phases, and I actually have videos for you to see the eight phases, each in very little clips of like one to two minutes, uh, just because I thought that would be kind of fun. Um, if we have time, um, we're going to hone in on one of the phases, phase two, because this phase two stabilization and um, state shift phase is the most important. And then we'll talk about uh, the different um, populations that can benefit from EMDR and hopefully some time for Q&A. But like I said, um, we've got Robert there if you have any questions. And Robert is very good at interrupting me because if there wasn't anybody out there to interrupting, uh, interrupt me, my trainings would go for like eight hours straight with no breaks and no lunch. So let's start with neurobiology. Uh, we pull a lot of language from, uh, on our neurobiology section from Vanderkolk and um, Robin Shapiro's uh, book, the, um, her um, EMDR uh, basic um, book that I think it was just edited uh, two years ago. Unfortunately, she passed in the last couple of years, but the book, um, and we also pull from Daniel Siegel's language. And so you're gonna recognize some of that. And then one other uh, big name when it comes to the brain is Al Shore. So let's talk about how a memory is formed. Um, one of the things I love, I'm dyslexic myself, so I love visuals. And there's a lot of really good visuals in this training. So I pulled some um, slides here for you. Um, so when we have a memory, when we have information that enters into our brain, we're just gonna look at the, the journey that it goes on here. And it starts in the thalamus, and then the thalamus um, sends it to the amygdala and the amygdala, amygdala has a decision to make. When looking at its emotional significance, it's either going to um, keep it, it's gonna stop everything and it's going to um, uh, react in the way that it needs to react or it's going to move it over to the prefrontal cortex where you'll see a conversation between the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. And this is where it is um, uh, processed and then it is um, categorized and stored as an experience. That would be what you would want. Um, when we go into the amygdala and there's an intense amount of emotion, then it doesn't make it to the prefrontal cortex. And that's what we call being amygdala hijacked. And that would be because the intensity of whatever um, that incident is, was too overwhelming for the brain at that point in time, uh, taking into consideration uh, brain development, and um, environment, safety, uh, resilience, et cetera. So if the memory does not go into the prefrontal cortex, but it ends up stopping in the amygdala, then what are we looking at? Well, first of all, we're looking at as, as being a male adaptively stored memory. So, and that means that it's gonna be broken up and, um, and stored in different parts of the drain, brain. So right here, we've got this brain. I don't know if it's blinking for you, but it blinks for me. And it's just uh, wants to um, share that we have trauma that's stored in all of our senses. So I, uh, for example, um, the uh, kiddos that I work with um, who um, had a father that died of organ failure in the hospital, um, when working with them um, using EMDR, we needed to target different aspects of the trauma where it was stored. So it, for example, it would be the smell of the hospital room, or it would be the sound of the hospital machines, or it would be the feel of their um, father's skin as he was passing, or it would be the IVs, or it would be um, you know, the jaundice in their, his eyes. So just to give you an example of how the intensity of the trauma can be locked away in different aspects. It also can be locked away in emotions. Um, the majority of our, or I should say all trauma to some extent is also stored in our body. So that would be the body keeps the score. And so um, another example would be like a child being attacked by a dog, um, how that information is stored. It's also gonna be stored at the age of the client. So if a five-year-old gets attacked by a dog, 
then every time that trauma memory is triggered, and remember, it did not go into the part of the brain where it was categorized as a adaptive memory. It is considered a maladaptively stored memory. It um, is being stored at that age. So for example, attacked by a dog, bitten in the face at the age of five, I'm 25, I see a dog, and I'm going to react like I'm five years old. That is the maladaptive memory network that we want to go in and we want to rewrite. We need to change the code for that. Um, because until I'm able to understand that I'm 25 years old and have a lot of power and control over dogs, um, I'm going to feel like that five-year-old. And that's exactly what we're dealing with when we're dealing with traumatic memory. An analogy that we like to use about re-encoding re um, a traumatic memory is just looking at a computer. You know, we all work with computers, so it's kind of easy. So it's like you've got your document, um, your Word document that's on your hard drive or on your desktop. And um, let's say that you've got files. You've got one for dogs. You've got one for cars. You've got one for babysitters. And so you go over and you hover over and you open it up and consolidating would be all of those memories that come into play that are adaptively stored that have to do with dogs, cars, babysitters. But what happens is you also then have the maladaptively stored information. And so what can we do? We can go over and we can hover over that file and we can open it. We can activate it. And then we can go in and we can rewrite in new information. So for example, that dog that bit that five-year-old, 25 years old, I can open up that file and say, oh, now I'm 25 years old. I have power and control. I can tell that owner to get their dog back on their leash, or I can call 311, or I can not go anywhere near dog parks. So when we are rewriting, we are re-encoding, we are revising, we are updating the working memory. And then we can save as, and that's called reconsolidation. And this is something that came out in like 2004. So this is relatively new. And this is the brain research. Um, oh, I see a typo. Um, so let's look at the negative neural networks first. So when you have a trauma memory, a maladaptive trauma memory, we are looking at the fact that there are gonna be negative neural networks and there are gonna be positive neural networks. The negative neural networks, thank goodness, there's only two different type, types. So one is a frozen, and then the other is an isolated. A frozen PTSD, one and done memory, is where you have one incident that's so overwhelming that, like I said, it locks out the uh, frontal prefrontal cortex. It is an amygdala hijack. So um, for example, the dog bites me and I have this negative belief of I'm powerless. I'm five years old, I have no power and control. The dog completely had all the power and control. That is a one time event. And that is a PTSD criterion A diagnosis. Um, and that is where all the research, uh, the older research is with the MDR. We can use uh, EMDR, uh, the, the, the most powerful tool. There's five tools that we look at. And you can literally clear out a PTSD memory in three, five, eight sessions max. Okay, and that's where people get sent to me. Um, you know, can you take this client? They come from higher levels of care or talk therapist, and can you clear out or re-encode this one PTSD memory? And the answer is yes, I absolutely can. But there's a second type of uh, memory, and that's going to be a complex PTSD memory. And, you know, we're still just struggling to put language around this as far as diagnoses go. But just to give you an example of what a complex PTSD memory neural network looks like is my dad it rages at me daily. And my negative belief is I'm powerless. And so this is something that happens over and over and over and over again. And a lot of um, uh, isolated uh, memory networks are created uh, in utero. Um, and uh, during um, preverbal uh, uh, times in a uh, child's life. So a lot of times when we go into work with this, it doesn't have language, which means that we're gonna be working with the body. And I think I mentioned EMDR is eight phases. One of the phases is all about the body. And so when we're talking about somatic experiencing and how clients will have a lot of memories that are um, 
uh, housed in their sensations with no language, um, uh, we need to be able to uh, pay special attention to that because uh, that, that can be some really intense work. And so, like I said, of the eight phases, one of them uh, speaks to the body. So luckily, like I said, there's only two types of trauma memory neural networks, which leaves us with when we're doing a treatment plan for a client, the treatment plans are not that complicated. In fact, they're really easy. Um, the work, that's a different story, but the visuals that we use in the training um, is that when we're talking about a one-time uh, memory, like I said, getting bit by the dog or a car accident, um, you know, um, witnessing or seeing um, the result of um, someone who suicided, that would be the one-time event versus a neural network where you have trauma memories that are going to be identified because they happened over and over and over again. And so um, we use these neg these um, triangles as uh, descriptors for our negative neural networks. And so when we create a treatment plan for our clients, we literally can go up to our whiteboard and we can draw out, oh, here is that you know, PTSD memory you were telling me about. And then here's what was going on for you under the age of four, um, because we can actually list out uh, different traumas that are associated with different like beliefs or um, schemas that the client experienced. So like I said, there are two different types of trauma memories. Um, and the easiest one to talk about is the frozen trauma one and done memory. Like I said, which is that one time event. It is the, um, you know, the PT diagnosis where you need your criteria A. And if you don't have that criterion, then you don't have PTSD. This is what, where it's, the research is done. It's uh, EMDR is 90% effective uh, with using, um, uh, the, like I said, the tool, the EMD big R, and just to uh, go into this one more time as to what's happening, we've got the uh, powerless, I'm powerless here, and we have the information entering into the thalamus, it goes to the amygdala, the amygdala decides, oh, nope, this is too intense, we're not taking it anywhere else, and the key piece here is that the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus are locked out. And this is gonna be the key going forward. So it's really important. I'm gonna ask if there's any questions after this, but this slide's super important for you to understand what happens next. So we've got an amygdala hijack and this is not available. So just for example, you know, when my clients come from higher level of care, like I get a lot that come from, um, you know, IOPs, and that are doing step downs and they have all these great skills, these DBT skills, these CBT skills or clients that are coming in from program that have all this great step work that they're working on. If they get amygdala hijack, they can't access that information. So, it, you know, like they have a great toolbox but we've got to make sure that the client can access that toolbox. And this is where our EMDR tools come in because our goal is gonna to be to unlock this so that we can access the information here. And then once we've accessed this information, we want to recode it and resave it. And that is what memory reconsolidation is. So before I go on, I just wanna make sure that this visual makes sense. How are things going, Robert? Good. Okay. Any questions on that? Not yet. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as you saw um, um, with the, um, let's see, where was it? This is our negative neural network. So now we're going to get into brain, what the brain looks like when we're doing our work. We talk about the negative neural network as being where that trauma, um, that isolated or that uh, frozen trauma memory is located. And then for every negative neural network, we need to find a positive neural network. And the positive neural network is located in the part of the brain that we can't get to if, we have, if we're experiencing an amygdala hijack. But besides that, 
We'll get to that in a minute. What does a positive neural network look like? Well, this is a super cool slide because look at how this is. This is like, like um, neurons that fire together, wire together. Here's this, this little boy, he's being read to as a kid and he's got these neurons that are firing. I love reading. And then he's reading as himself as he's five, six and seven and he's getting great feedback. I'm such a great reader. And then he's in his, his fantasy prone and he's reading all about like Harry Potter and all these other cool um, uh, places places that he can go um, outside of real life. And he's getting more positive um, feedback from that. And then he ends up going to school and getting his master's degree and becoming a psychologist. And so here we are with this very strong, nicely um, uh, um, enhanced positive neural network. And in our trainings, we, uh, we utilize the upside down triangle to identify the positive neural network because the key to the work that we do, we have clients that come in with lots and lots and lots of very intense and large negative neural networks, but the positive ones are harder to find. And not only do we have to find them, but we need to activate them and we need to strengthen them and we need to enhance them. And that's a big uh, part of the work that we do. And, you know, like I said, it's, it's, uh, it's all part of the training because if you don't have a positive neural network, then EMDR is just not going to work. So <laughs> when you have that trauma maladaptively stored memory, the reason, one of the reasons why it is living or located and functioning the way that it is, and I guess this is the, the right language, why it behaves differently is because it is locked out of its access to the positive neural network. So you have um, I'm uh, powerless, I'm being attacked by a dog, the dog's biting me, and over here would be protection, um, this would be getting my needs met, this would be me being able to take care of myself. Well, at five, if I wasn't able to, right? So that's what that negative neural network is. But at 25, I can. And here, this is where 25 lives. This is what says, I am an adult and I can protect myself and take care of myself. But because of the, the memory being maladaptively stored and the past is present, um, we are being activated as a five-year-old. And so we cannot access the information from this part of the brain. And so with the bilateral, when we get into EMDR, which is um, any type of uh, going right, left, right, left, and I'm just doing it with my um, pointer right now, hopefully you can see it, we are looking to bind or connect these two neural networks where the positive is actually gonna come and merge with and uh, uh, create what will be an adaptive memory network after we get done using our EMDR tool. This is just a slide I threw in because I did a, pres a presentation for Brazil um, a month or two ago. And we were looking at COVID, you know, at the time, and they still are experiencing a lot worse COVID um, uh, issues right now. It was actually um, COVID in adolescence. And when we talk about our negative beliefs of like, I am powerless, or I am worthless, or I am invisible and unimportant, these are the messages that we're given, uh, the emotional memories that we have encoded in our brain, uh, like I said, generally from childhood. Um, everybody experienced these last year. So as therapists, it's really important, more important now, like no other time to become EMDR trained because we need to be working with the messages that people got um, last year, feeling alone due to iso uh, social isolation or the unknown and the feeling powerless. We had a lot of relapses in the sobriety community because the powerlessness was overwhelming. Um, a lot of guilt or feeling responsible for everything. A lot of parents that are responsible for making really difficult decisions right now um, around their children and what schooling looked like and who you could be um, exposed to and who you couldn't. Fear of dying because there were a lot of loved ones that we lost. We've got emotional scars of just, I'm not okay, especially if you got COVID. And then just the stress, the energy that's been in um, our homes uh, and as far as how the parents are dealing with their work environment and taking care of kids or if they were losing their job or if they had to go to work um, as a um, frontliner and was not vaccinated. So all of these things, um, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, PTSD coming out of other countries that 
uh, got COVID, um, had the intensity of the COVID ahead of us. And so this is, there's going to be a lot of work for us to do um, going forward. So anyway, I just kind of threw that in there. So we've talked about the negative, um, we've talked about the two types of trauma memories, okay? And we've talked about um, the, uh, how there's a negative um, neural network and a positive neural network and how that there are beliefs that are assigned to them, but we don't really need to get into that part. But the key is, is that um, we have many tools that are taught in our EMDR training. And this is an example of, um, there are five of them. And so I have them broken down. Um, this would be a one-time PTSD trauma, right? That's what the star represents. And then this over here would be an isolated trauma memory network. And the memory network usually houses many traumas. So if I was molested from three to six, and then I was raped in high school, and then I, I'm in, with an abusive man in my adulthood, that's what complex PTSD looks like. So you have many different PTSD targets within a neural network that houses um, a isolated um, negative message around um, no power and control, uh, being invisible and unimportant, maybe being unlovable and worthless. And all of these have root causes. And I put root cause here at the bottom. Where's my pointer at? Okay, there it is. I put root causes here at the bottom because that's where we put it on uh, when we're creating a visual treatment plan for our client. Because every symptom, every behavior is in service of our client's survival. And it comes from a root cause. So when we're looking at addiction and we're looking at what it is that the client is medicating, we need to find the root cause because that's where the addiction is, is, has originated. And that is also the case for like OCD, for self-harm, for you know the majority of uh, behaviors that get in the way of our client's ability to function um, we, if we look at the symptoms, like for example, teletrichomania or misophonia, these are diagnoses that come into my, my office. And I'll say to my client, you know, I understand that you want to look at the symptom and you want to stop pulling your hair out or picking your skin, but we need to figure out what the root cause is because that behavior is assisting you with something. And so the root cause is generally here at the bottom of our um, negative neural network. And the root cause can be anything from being in utero and being in a car accident. I'm just pulling from, from some of my clients um, from, from being in an orphanage for five months, from being adopted um, where the birth mother is handing the, uh, the, the baby off to a new family. Um, when we, or we have um, you know, mom that's depressed and never emotionally available or raging alcoholic parents. Um, we have neglect that's more harmful than even sexual abuse. We have all kinds of things that are root causes. And so a big part of our work is being able to find that root cause and what was going on, because what we want to do is we want to rewrite the encoded memory neural networks. We want to go in and we literally want to erase what was there and replace it with what is going on for them um, today as empowered adults. And so what, how can we do that? We do that with our EMDR toolbox and you're gonna learn all of these tools. You're gonna learn EMD Big R, which is what the advertisement is for EMDR. And you're also gonna learn EMD Little R, you're gonna learn EMD, you're gonna learn ATIP and you're gonna learn CID. And all of these tools are different and what they are able to um, uh, bring to you as far as um, uh, meeting the client where they're at and contracting with the client. So if the client comes in and says, I don't wanna talk about anything that happened to me as a child, but I do wanna talk about how I'm really struggling in intimate relationships right now. We can pull out the tools here, CID and ATIP or EMD, and we can work with them on what's going on today. And we don't have to talk about what happened in the past. And not only that, but super cool, because you're working in that neural network, let's say I'm working on this target right here, it drains from the same trauma pool. So I'm always going to be assisting with draining from what happened when I was three to five years old, even though I'm only targeting what I'm doing today. Okay. So I get really excited about it. 
So you're thinking, well, okay, you've done a lot of talking about memory and you've, you're telling us all these great things that EMDR can do, but how the frick does it work? Well, if you want to know what EMDR does, go buy this book. I mean, I'm not, I can't do this in two hours, but I'm going to try to do it in like five to 10 minutes. This guy, he was a um, uh, research physicist, physicist in his first career and then uh, for 14, 15 years, and then he transferred or um, transitioned transition into being a therapist. So he's, he knows his stuff. And um, the research really around unlocking the emotional brain is um, early 2000s, so it's not that old. Um, and basically I have it highlighted in a really obnoxious yellow. I mean, this basically tells us exactly what we're doing. We are unlocking those very early memories. Our goal is to eliminate the symptoms at their roots using memory reconsolidation. So what am I doing? I'm just gonna throw some language out there. We are providing erasure. We want to erase. Now I didn't come up with that word. That sounds like a pretty aggressive word. You're gonna erase what happened to me when I was a kid. We're not gonna erase the memories but we're going to make, we're going to erase the emotions. We're going to erase the beliefs and the schemas and your interpretation and your perspective of what happened to you when you were young. So a rewriting of the previously encoded memory networks, according to our attachment environment, like really, I mean, right. So erasing the emotional meetings, the models, the beliefs of an event or a self-protective tactic, because I can guarantee you that 99.9% .9 of behaviors are in service of survival. And so we need to go into our client's unconscious implicit memory and pull out what it is that these root causes and that, I'm sorry, that these symptoms and behaviors are assisting. And we also need to be able to identify what that root cause is. So how does Bruce say this works? And I'm sorry for all the language, but this is um, a newer slide for me. This is a synapsis, okay? Kind of cool looking. We are looking for what's called transformational change. This is, like I said, the breakthrough came in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And it says here, we don't, we want transformational change, but not degrees of incremental, you know, I'm not going to get into that. So transformational change, what is that and how do we do it? Transformational means that it's permanent. It means that once you've shifted the client's perspective, it is there to stay. This is, I guess I will use increment. It is not about increments of change. It's not about, I'm not gonna talk about other orientations because in my world, if you're, what you do works, then that's great. But we are talking about rewriting code. And so if I walk up to an elevator and I'm terrified to get on it and I pull up all of my self positive statements and start doing my breathing and my grounding, I'm doing, I'm creating a state shift for myself so that I can then enter the elevator because I've calmed myself down. I've soothed the uh, central nervous system. But what I want is I want transformational change. I want to walk up to that elevator and not give a um, hoot. <laughs> so um, that's what transformational change is. And how do we do that? It's three steps. It's updating, rewriting, and replacing. This is not important for you to know other than these three um, key steps to transformational change are in our eight phases of EMDR. That's the connection that I want you to make. So all the words on these slides, I'm gonna pull some stuff out to just um, throw at you. But at the end of the day, EMDR is eight phases. And when we are doing the step one, which is updating and reactivating, we do that in our EMDR phases one and three. And we're, when we're rewriting that encoded experience, we need to um, create a, a prediction error or a mismatch. And we do that in our phase three. And then we go in and we rewrite with our phase four, because our phase four, and we're gonna talk about this, is the um, natural healing process that we're talking about. It's the natural healing process of the brain that we do every night in our sleep. Don't want to get ahead of myself. And then the step three, which is replacing um, that new information with the new information and erasing the old. And don't, don't think the memories are erased. 
not the content of the memories that will always be the same, but the perspective and the emotional reaction, the emotional memory is what gets shifted. Looking at your life through a different lens, that's what changes and gets rewritten. And we honor that with phase five and I should have put phase six in there. So you've got your phases one through six in here of eight that speak to um, Bruce Eckert's transformation um, of the brain, okay? So I'll take um, any questions here before I move on because that is the brain piece. And now Nothing to find out. Yet. Yep. Nothing yet. Okay, good. Okay. Ruby. Okay. <clears throat> so what is EMDR? Hold on. It's a crazy uh, name, but it, it works. All right, we'll see how I'm doing with time. Hold on. Um, let's see. Here. 40. Oh, I'm right on time. I'm supposed to be at Bruce at 1040. All right, we'll see. So what is EMDR? Eye movement desensitization reprocessing. It's a mouthful. Um, we're going to talk about eye movements because eye movements are your eyes starting back and forth which they do every single night. For most of you that are not experiencing PTSD or flashbacks or nightmares, you are getting REM sleep. If you go on your Fitbit and you look at your app, it'll tell you how much REM sleep you got last night. If you hit REM and you hit the link, it'll tell you that REM is a healing process of the brain. I don't know what else to tell you. It is a natural healing process of the brain. So when I go in and I wanna move your eyes back and forth, I'm not doing something goofy to you, I am looking for your movement that your eyes do every night so that I can help you track. That's all I'm doing. So there's nothing goofy about it. It's just kind of goofy to see, to look at. Uh, luckily we've gone online in the last year and now we no longer need to do just eye movements. Uh, we're doing a lot of bilateral tapping and if you take the training, we'll tell you why. Um, but right now we're just gonna focus on the name, which is the eye movements. So I am activating, it's like starting an engine, an old like outboard um, motor on a, a boat where you pull the cord or you're doing the lawnmower and you like pull the cord and you activate the, you get the uh, motor going. That's exactly what we're doing here is we are activating that natural healing process in your brain that um, uh, just by doing those eye movements. And my fingers are looking to track your eyes, not, not, not the other way around. So eye movements, then desensitization, the goal is to desensitize. If I'm in an amygdala hijack, that means my heart rate is up, my blood pressure up is up. If we're looking at polyvagal, I'm mobilized, I'm ready to fight or flight, and I need somebody to come in and calm me down, bring down my heart rate. I need to be um, desensitized. So this natural healing, the goal is to bring the client's um, dysregulation down, which then if you think about that slide that I really needed you to understand, you can shift from being in an amygdala hijack into the frontal cortex where you can access all of your tools and strategies and positive beliefs, everything that you need, your problem solving options, et cetera. So eye movements, natural healing process to desensitize and then reprocessing. The language that I like to use for reprocessing is new learning. Because as you shift the client out of the amygdala hijack into the frontal cortex where the, all the information is, there is new learning, a shift in perspective. This is where the rewriting or the re-encoding comes in. Okay, I just spent a lot of time on just the title. So EMDR, now you know what it means. If you remember it, that's a whole other thing. Francine Shapiro is our originator and uh, just listen to the story. Don't worry about the slides. Francine Shapiro was um, in the uh, 1980s. She was um, a PhD in literature. She got diagnosed from can with cancer and she was super stressed out about it. Anybody would be. Um, she had a lot of appointments. She had a lot of um, bad news that came her way. And so this is a quote that comes from her book. I have cancer and I want to study the mechanisms of mental change to assist my stressful journey. So that's what she did. She shifted over and changed her um, focus of study 
And she went into um, researching what it is that could assist her with feeling better. It's as, it's as easy as that. And so um, some of the things that, one of the things that she came across was eye movements. Eye movements have been around for a long time. She did not make up eye movements. She researched what would be of assistance to reduce heart rates, to assist with um, uh, desensitizing, reducing dysregulation. And so there's this piece um, in the very beginning of her book where she goes and she walks in a park and people make fun of EMDR because they're like, oh yeah, Francine's walking through a park and she just started moving her eyes back and forth. No, she's moving her eyes back and forth, yes. But because she did her research and decided that this was one of the many different modalities that she was going to try. So she is walking through the park, moving her eyes back and forth. And she, she's um, thinking about what's distressing for her. Those were her targets. And she found that it did make her feel better. And so that's where, when she went to write her dissertation, she put together um, uh, a... Um, uh, the information that she needed, the research that she needed to do by putting together 22 clients with PTSD symptoms. This is the very first time that anything was ever published about EMDR. But now the key here though, is that it was not EMDR. It was called EMD at the time. There was no R. So in 1989, we called it eye movement desensitization because all she wanted to do was desensitize. All she wanted to do was to help the client feel better. And she didn't know about the shift that was going on in the brain and the new learning that was coming up. So EMD is what it was called. She got 22 clients together that all had PTSD symptoms. And then she um, created measurables, which we use to this day. I'm not going to go into them, but we have a negative measurement and a positive measurement. And insurance companies love it. We put them in our notes all the time. Insurance companies love to see that the negative uh, measurements are going down and the positive measurements are going up. And then she did very short sets of eye movements. Okay, so we start with eye movements. That's where we start. And once again, we are duplicating that from, right? We're duplicating that he natural healing that we utilize every night when we sleep. She would um, have the uh, clients focusing on their flashbacks only. So just very single target incidents, right? <clears throat> Criteria A. And then these were the results. The results were um, for the SUDS, uh, which is the negative. Um, <clears throat> for those that did EMD, they went from a very high negative score to a low negative score, of course. And then here you have the control group, which was just supportive talk therapy. And they actually got more activated. And usually in my training, I'll say, and why do you think that they were more activated? I don't know. Can people respond if I ask a question? Can you see that, Robert? So, yeah. Um, why would people be more activated using supportive talk therapy when working on a, a trauma target? Let's see. Activation of memories. Yes, exactly. Activation of memories. That are not rewritten yet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we tell people in EMDR that we don't want the chapter. We just want the title. All you do is have to tell me what it is that we're targeting, but you don't have to go into it. So here in the supportive talk therapy, you had the clients um, talking about their trauma which then made them actually more activated than they started. Um, then also we have the positive measurements where we saw a before and after, and the positive is going to be accessing that information from the prefrontal cortex. And so, um, sorry, I sometimes live near a hospital. Um, hold on, it's hard for me to focus. So we have the um, positive measurements that increase because we are desensitizing the client. And as you bring the client's heart rate down and you are regulating the client, they are able to move into the part of their brain where they can access positive, more supportive um, data or information. 
which then shows up in the measurements um, post-treatment. So the outcomes were desensitization of highly distressing memories. It worked, but also there was this piece where there was a shift in visual imagery. Um, don't know what comes first, the chicken or the egg, but desensitization and shift in visual imagery is what we learn um, that we can do with EMD for any client that walks in with a PTSD memory, which is great for flashbacks, which is great for um, one time, like I said, criterion A uh, PTSD diagnosis. In 1989, after the release of her publication, basically the training institute was born. And since then it's just taken off. Um, the EMDR Training Institute, this is, I just think this is funny, is the second largest training organization in the country. Uh, EMDR Consulting is the largest, and that would be who we work for. I think that's funny, Robert. Yeah, <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> You're laughing hard. <laughs> we've grown very quickly. Uh, we've, we've got a great training. We got a lot of great trainings because we have a lot of trainers. But so um, this is a story by Andrew Leeds, who in 1991, well, let's see if it's a story. I'm, I wasn't sure if this was going to work or not, who tells a story about EMDR. All right, it may work. Robert, can you see it? Will you tell me? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear it okay. Sure. Andrew, um, tell us a little bit, go back to the beginning and tell us a little bit about your history with EMDR and what prompted your interest in uh, learning EMDR and ultimately training others in EMDR. Well, let me start just a little bit before my training in EMDR back in 1979 when my wife and I were in a motor vehicle crash. And she had some physical injuries and I was not physically injured, but I was not functioning very well afterwards. And what I didn't know until a few years later was that I had PTSD. Of course, I couldn't have PTSD in 1979 because it didn't come into existence until 1980 when the DSM-3 uh, came out. And so when I learned about that, it kind of became a mission of mine to look for ways of treating PTSD. I didn't think that other people should have to suffer for months or years after developing PTSD. And at that time, I wasn't very impressed with the available treatments, which at that time were primarily prolonged and vaginal exposure. It just didn't appeal to my sensibilities. So nothing really showed up on my radar until 1991, actually 1990, when I got a flyer in the mail about an EMDR training that was being held in Sonoma County, where I was living at that time. And I didn't go because I associated the use of eye movements with uh, another approach that I knew had no research behind it. And I thought, okay, this can't work either. And then about six months later in um, the spring of 1991, I got a postcard in the mail from a psychiatric hospital that I respected having a grand rounds presentation with Francine Shapiro. And I thought they're sponsoring this person <laughs> who's doing this wacky eye movement thing. So the postcard mentioned that she had some publications. So I went to our local university library and they had both of the publications there. And I looked at her research and I immediately thought this is, this is either some sort of trick, some sort of deception, or it's the most important development in the field of psychology in 125 years because no one could resolve traumatic memories that fast. So I went to the lecture and that was in early June of 1991. I had the same perplexing problem during the lecture because as I listened and as I watched her videos, I couldn't believe it was real. It was too quick, but I couldn't take the chance that it was as effective as it seemed to be. And so the next weekend there was a training in Berkeley and I went. And I had some remarkable experiences in my practice exercises. I began using EMDR the next week in my practice. Uh, almost all of the sessions that I had were successful the very first week I began using it. And I continued to use it 
on a weekly basis in my practice. Uh, in October of 1991, I attended the second weekend of the basic training in EMDR. And at the second training, one of the training supervisors came up to me and asked if I was interested in joining the training staff. I was thrilled. I was convinced that this was a very exciting development in the field that eventually would be research uh, validated. And I joined the training staff in November of 1991. And by February of the following year, I was um, the chair of the training supervisor selection and training committee. I was helping to train other training supervisors. By the end of that year, 1992, I was a trainer in training. By 1993, I was beginning to teach the basic training. And by the end of 1993, I was authorized to conduct uh, weekend one and weekend two trainings for Francine Shapiro. And I continued to do that for 17 years. So I, it, it's been a very fast moving train. It's completely transformed my professional life. I continue to practice full time in Santa Rosa, California. But I've trained about 15,000 mental health professionals throughout the United States uh, and Europe and Japan. And I've published articles and book chapters and a book on EMDR. And I never thought that I was going to go that direction. I had, I had pretty much given up on most of the treatment outcome research in the field of psychology. But I was forced back into looking at it as a result of my involvement with EMDR. And I follow the research very closely now. A lot of the research is still not very good, but uh, we, we now have achieved a, a great deal of international recognition for EMDR. And it's been a privilege to be involved with EMDR from almost the beginning, with, um, originally with the EMDR Institute and, and then since uh, uh, 2010 with my own training institute. Okay. So, um, you know, like uh, with most trainings, um, you're going to get like the advertisement of, oh, this guy says it's the greatest. Um, Andrew Leeds, the reason why I showed him, first of all, there's several different interviews that you can look up on YouTube if you want to learn more from him, but he has the best research on his website. So Robert's going to put out his website. Um, he is he he made this uh, did this interview five years ago and the research that's coming out of the Netherlands right now is priceless. So um, there's so much more research even since he did his interview. And uh, like I said, the most updated uh, research is on his website. So Robert will put that out. So um, EMDR has not been a lot around that long. <laughs> um, as we start to get into uh, the actual research and what um, helps EMDR do what it does. Um, I want to look at three main um, action mechanisms. I'm not going to go into two of them because that would be, you know, a big part of the training. But the one that I do want to mention is the, and you can just write down these articles and just Google them and pull them up if you need to look any of these up. But here we have in 2002 is when the connection between the REM sleep um, and the eyes moving back and forth, the modulation between the brain wave frequencies and how uh, that affected um, the healing. And so we are literally able to duplicate that in our sessions, what it is that clients are hopefully getting at night. And the, the other key thing about this is not only are you doing good work with the client in the session, but between sessions, if your client is getting REM sleep, the work continues. So, you know, when you go to sleep worried about something, your eyes dart back and forth automatically and you feel uh, better when you wake up in the morning. But now what we're doing is if you're doing it, your EMDR trauma work and you're tar targeting something in your trauma session, then you go home and at night it continues to work on that. Clients come back a week later feeling better and they'll say things like, I don't even know why we talked about that last week. It's not bothering me at all. And so it's just because it's the natural healing process process, we have the brain helping us as therapists um, so much. And then in 2003, the Orienton response, this is going to be um, Peter Levin's work. And then in 2008, the working memory. And the working memory, um, I'm not going to go into what uh, either, either of these are, but the working memory research that's coming out of the Netherlands right now is priceless. So um, Robert, once again, will put out the uh, link to Ed Dijon's work. He has 12 um, psychologists on staff that are doing research um, daily on using EMDR 
uh, with exposure CBT because everybody out in the Netherlands is trained in both and um, the incredible results that they're having with CPTSD, which is something that we don't even, like I said, have a diagnosis for in our country. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you one of the tools. There are five tools uh, in our EMDR toolbox. And this one's called CID. It's our, it's our baby tool. It's our youngest tool, um, even though it looks kind of scary. Um, it's for critical incident desensitization. And it's when a client is dysregulated in the moment. So like I had um, uh, a um, dance studio, maybe some of you clinicians, if you're from my area, um, remember this, but there was a dance studio where the owner um, uh, suicided and uh, he hung himself. And so there was a lot of really traumatized um, students. And so this would be the type of thing that you would go in and you could um, desensitize at a critical moment, like within the first 12 to 24 hours of there being some type of traumatic event. Like uh, another example would be my client getting in a car accident on the way into my parking lot, where I had one teenager who on the weekend pulled in in his, his, uh, his very old car and hit the guy who worked um, down the hall for me, hit his Porsche. So these are types of things where the client's very distressed in the moment. And all we're gonna show you is how eye movements can bring down a client's distress in a very short amount of time. So um, do me a favor and watch her face and see how distressed she is and not watch uh, Roy's eye movements, um, if you're okay with that. And so just watch how her body language shifts with just um, you know a handful of eye movement sets. And Robert, give me a thumbs up if everything looks good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I'm feeling pretty emotional today, so I don't think I'm up for, I mean, it'd be a great opportunity, but I'm not up for being um, okay. like handed and be filmed okay. on um, yeah, something, something opening up too much, right? Yeah. yeah. So maybe just an A-tip, just kind of a acute traumatic incident processing experience on maybe what's just happening right now. Um, if you would be, uh, that would keep it kind of tightly held and controlled. Yeah, before we do that, what's the difference between CID and ATIP? Because I was trained in ATIP. Yeah, so the CID is kind of a later version. It's basically incident and sudden. And it doesn't get into the negative and positive beliefs at all. So it's really very truncated. We could do that too, if you just want to think, I just got something going on and I don't need to necessarily put language to it. It's usually, um, the way I've been teaching is when somebody is really in an acute crisis and it's like right in their face uh, and they're overwhelmed with just like, I can't even get see, get by this then, and they don't have language for it yet. Just what's, what's the incident, what's the level of disturbance. And then you use the short sets uh, and then just continue to ask for the sud. And then as it gets a little bit more distant and they're able to put language to it, like I'm overwhelmed, I can't handle it, uh, something like that, then that's the ATIP where they add the they add the language as well. So it's it's that's a little bit more distant from the, the from the crisis. So it's probably something I've introduced the last year or so. I don't know how this is going to work cuz I'm already getting activated just thinking oh. about it. Okay. Well, maybe just think about how how activated are you right now? 0 to 10. Um maybe an 8. Okay. Should we try, can you kind of follow my fingers on the screen and see how this works? Okay, just kind of follow my fingers and let's see what happens. Watch her face. Okay, so take a breath. Now, when you think about it, whatever that is, how much is it disturbing you? Zero to 10. Seven. Okay. Seven. Okay, let's do that. Okay, a breath. Now, when you think about how disturbing is it to you now? Seven. Okay. Your hand's cutting off on that on that side of the screen. Over here. Okay. Yes. So maybe I can let me let me move a little bit further over here. Okay, I was trying not to come in front. Okay, so I'll try to get a little bit more of a range. Let's try to see what we can do now. Okay, so now when you, how disturbing is it to you? 
It's lowering. I'll put it at a five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now when you think about it, how disturbing is it to you? Zero to 10. Four. Okay. So now when you think about it, how disturbing is it to you? Three. Okay. Okay. So now how disturbing is it to you? Zero to ten. Still a three. Okay. Let's see again. Okay. And now, how disturbing is it to you? Two. Okay. Okay. Ah, so now, how disturbing is it to you? Maybe a one or an ecological two. Okay. So that kind of makes sense, maybe under the circumstances it ought to be there? Yes. Okay. But it's not, it's not here. It's, it's not there okay. anymore. Yeah. Well, that you asked earlier what the CID is, and that, that, that's it. That's right there. Yeah. Just without a whole lot of information, just adding the sets of eye movements, uh, or I could have done tapping. This is the, another variation. But it just kind of brings it down, um, and then it creates a situation where if you're working with a client, you can be talking with them about it now. Um, but if you feel like that's what you needed to do today, um, we don't have to do anything more. Okay. So a couple different things here. First of all, you don't have to talk about anything. In fact, you're not supposed to talk about anything. This is a natural healing process of the brain. So she was distressed, dysregulated. This was a woman that was supposed to come on and do um, one of the uh, bigger treatment plan targets. And she, was, she just got really dysregulated right there in the beginning. And so um, it's just a nice piece of work just showing what short sets of eye movements can do because that's exactly what Francine did in her dissertation. Watching her body change, her body language change from being distressed to actually having a smile on her face, how relaxed she became, that was not anything that Roy did. That was the eyes darting back and forth and how that was activating the, um, the um, corpus callosum, which then engages the right brain, which then engages the body. Because when we do talk therapy, we're, you know, Daniel Siegel language, we're doing left brain work. So we want to activate everything when we're doing um, our trauma work. And so once again, the eye movements were the natural um, change agent, the action mechanism that went in and assisted with calming her down. As she calms down, if you study polyvagal, it's all about a rupture repair for the central nervous system. You know, if your heart rate is 110 or above, you can't access your frontal cortex. You're an amygdala hijack. She calmed down with the eye movements. Then she was able to access um, information that was able to um, assist with her dysregulation, okay? And then just a bonus, we also get a shift in visual imagery. Uh, she didn't have any visual imagery, so we weren't able to see that, but just know that that's a thing. Um, the, the research that came in after uh, Francine's um, discovery, I'm just gonna touch base on it um, in 2013. And once again, I just wanna reiterate, look how young this is. Look how, I mean, this is, we are in the early stages of EMDR and our training alone has already changed three to four times just during the pandemic. We are constantly updating so that we can stay on top of the brain science and um, what's going on in our environment. So it was not until 2013 that CBT and EMDR were even considered together uh, to look at trauma. And then, um, uh, th this is a 20 out of 21 um, PTSD and cancer. This was um, specific to Francine because that was her focus, being that she was struggling with cancer and it is what she did pass away of in the last couple of years. 
I've highlighted in yellow here the keys um, with this additional research. In 2014, changes in memory, vividness, and emotionality. So this is around what happens with eye movements. So changes in memory, vividness. If I have a flashback that involves a rape, if I have a flashback that involves a fire, a car accident, um, some type of physical abuse, sexual abuse, the memory vividness shifts. My clients say that the, if let's say it's a perpetrator that is on top of them, that the face starts to dissipate, that the face gets further away, that the, the visual is harder to find. Uh, when I talked about my kiddos that were at the hospital with um, their dad dying, the beeping of the machines, the smell of the room, we target all of those independently and we get a vividness. The smell goes away, the sound goes away and the distress comes down so that it's no longer a trigger that then creates the amygdala hijack, which then means that the client can't access their prefrontal cortex. So this is um, eye movements during recall cause reduction in memory, vividness, and emotionality. This is super important. It's the key to our work and the gifts that we can bring to our clients. And you can tell I put that in there. The APA came out in uh, 2004 and uh, said that we are a thing. Um, the Veterans uh, Department of Veteran Affairs and Department of Defense, it depends on what state you're in. Some states uh, use it across the board, others not so much. Love SAMHSA when they came in. In fact, um, I'm thinking, I think I was working at Peer Services then. Um, SAMHSA came in and said that they uh, recommend EMDR for PTSD, anxiety, and depression symptoms. That was a biggie. Um, and then, of course, the World Health Organization coming out in 2013 saying that uh, CBT and EMDR are the only two psychotherapies recommended for children, adolescents, and adults with PTSD. And that was huge. Um, any thoughts or questions? Let's see, am I on time here? Um, I am, okay. Um, what we're gonna do next, let's see if there's any thoughts or questions, is now we're gonna go into what the eight phases look like of EMDR. But let's see if you have anything. Not, not yet. Okay, all right. So what I want you guys to see is I want you to see, now remember, this is a six day training uh, that you do in two weekends. Friday, Saturday, Sunday are usually my days of choice. And um, except for if you do an intensive, I just did an intensive last week where we did a Monday through Friday. So you can do five days intensives or you can do uh, the two, three days. Um, and actually, I think our price, Rory dropped it to one of the lowest prices out there because uh, the online trainings, we don't, don't know how long they're going to last. Um, right now we have permission. I, as a trainer, have permission to train until the end of this year. But um, just like with insurance companies, as the country um, starts rolling back into um, what the new normal is going to look like, uh, we're not sure what those online trainings are going to look like. So with that being said, I just wanted you guys to see little pieces of each phase of what we do. Um, it's not going to make much sense to you, but I just want you to um, get an idea of how um, not only is EMDR eight phases, it's not just something you do like this, the eye movement thingy is what my client calls it, but the, it's very well thought out. And so, you know, Pierre Genet, I always ask my uh, trainees when we start off, who's have even heard of Pierre Genet, because being trauma informed is really important. And I've done a lot of trauma 101 now in my training in the beginning, because in order to have an EMDR toolbox, which is going to be in your trauma toolbox, you know, you want to know what the other tools are and you want to be able to talk to other therapists about trauma. And everybody else talks about trauma from a stage perspective. So Pierre Genet, who literally started his work in the late 1800s, so it's been around for a long time, um, has uh, trauma work uh, categorized in stages. And so one of the things that's really nice about our eight phases is that they fit into Pierre Genet's three stages very nicely. So if you're over at like women care in Evanston, where I used to spend a lot of time, um, you know, and they're talking about what stage they're in, we as EMDR therapists can be like, okay, and that's our phases one and two, or that's our phases three, four, five, six, um, or that's our phase eight. So um, I just want to point that out. Like I said, it's, it's a, a many day training. Um, we're going to meet a client named Jocelyn here, and we are going to watch Roy do eight phases with her. They're just like two minute video clips of each phase. 
So um, we're going to start with, uh, I'm just going to go over this real quick, history taking. So history taking is what you guys do as intakes. You know, if you go over to Jocelyn and intake is a very, very thorough process. If you go to the Family Service Center and had me, it wasn't. Um, this is where the, therape the therapeutic alliance is going to evolve. And of course, the therapeutic alliance is more important than anything. Um, this is where you're going to contract with your client. I have clients that are, like I said, coming from higher level of care, coming from residential. The step downs are kind of amazing right now. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything in between um, and or coming in from um, a program or um, rehab or whatever clients are doing. If I'm going to be, I'm part of a team, an eating disorder team. Um, I'm working with another client who's in residential out in um, Colorado. It, it all depends. So that, that contracting with the client around what it is that they want to work on uh, is a big piece of phase one. And then phase two is going to be the, the part that everybody's going to be interested in. What do we do with preparation? We do grounding. We do breathing. We do um, what's called container. We do secure your space. We secure a space in a client's home to make sure that it's safe before we do any type of trauma processing. So securing the space would be, for example, what is it, Paula, in your office that helps you feel secure? Well, I have this beautiful um, uh, photograph from Fort Collins, Colorado, and they are aspens that are looking up into heaven. Um, I have my caps that I wear for my different training because I also train in Colorado. I have tulips that were given to me on Mother's Day. I have these are things that ground me right now. And I, you know, tattoos, you name it. What is it that grounds you? So we're teaching the client how to secure themselves with breathing, grounding, um, whatever it is that you bring to the table. Because I know a lot of you are very talented therapists and you're going to be integrating EMPR into the work that you already do. So there's not any replacing here. Um, so that's our phase two. And then our phase three is part of what Bruce Eckert was talking about with transformation. We need to access and activate a, um, a mem target memory. So any target memory the client wants, if it's something that happened yesterday or if it's something that happened 30 years ago. Then we move into our phase four, which is the desensitization, which is gonna be the eye movements. We are reducing the distress and shifting the visual imagery. And then phase five is um, what's called installation, where we go in and we are installing the, um, uh, the new information. This is where the rewriting comes in. This is where we're um, re-encoding the client's old um, memory messages. And now we're giving them the new updated, uh, explicit, um, positive uh, information. And so this is where that erasure of uh, the old um, target memories uh, happens. And then we have body scan because we honor the body and everything that the body holds. We have a whole phase for it. And then we do closure and then um, our integration is gonna be done in reevaluation. So like I said, six day training here. So just wanna give you a little bit of an idea of what it looks like. Um, meet Jocelyn, who's going to just uh, go through the process here very quickly because each phase is just a couple minutes. So here we go with the history taking and what's called the target sequencing plan. It is triangles on a piece of paper that literally spell out a negative neural network and a positive neural network, which we are going to link, bind, or connect. Sure, you decided to address. Um, my concerns and worries about retiring eventually and uh, hopefully sooner than later. Okay. I'm, I'm worried about will I be able to have control of it? Uh -huh. um, okay. So, so you know, when you think I just bring up the concept of retirement, what negative words best describe yourself in that situation? But I don't have control. I'm helpless. I'm helpless. Okay. It's, it's happening. And so then we think of retirement, what words would you like to have to best describe yourself? Um, that I'm empowered, that I can stay positive. Okay. Okay. Um, so are there any other uh, recent experiences where you have that sense of being activated or feeling helpless that you can recall? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Definitely. Um, a couple of years ago, I was, I got flipped over in my kayak and got pinned underwater. Any other times now, as you think about the word helpless, uh, any other times that come to mind earlier in your life? Yeah, uh, when I was around 12, um, at the 
the, the summer cottage where I was at with my family. I had, I had a friend visiting and we went out in a little outboard motorboat and I slipped and got flipped out of the boat. So I'm like in the middle of the lake and the boat's going around and... Yeah, okay. So I was yeah. feeling pretty helpless and yeah. knew I was in trouble too. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now is there any time that you might think is like earlier, maybe an early childhood that might, might uh, resonate with that same thought? Um, yeah, I had two older brothers. The oldest was kind of mean. Um, he cornered me on the dock and they hogtied me, you know, like your hands behind your uh, back and your feet up attached to them. Wow. And um, had this great big black dock water spider oh. that you find around docks and freshwater lakes a lot on a stick and was threatening to put the spider on me. Oh, okay. So, wow. okay. The target sequence plan has now been developed, built around I am totally helpless with a number of identified traumatic experiences starting with being tied on the dock. Off camera, we had discussed numerous times when Jocelyn had felt empowered to cope with various challenges. Therefore, we know that that positive network is in place and ready to integrate the negative. And so the key here is that with the bilateral, we're gonna end up binding, um, linking, connecting, marrying these two. So remember, when the client is triggered thinking about the spider on the end of the stick, which is actually her root cause is because it's her earliest memory, um, she's amygdala hijacked and she can't access this information. But as we go in and we use the eye movements, you're going to watch her shift from this space of being helpless here to now being able to incorporate all of these things that are part of her positive memory network where she feels empowered because she's actually a social worker and she passed her exams and she is empowered as a, a single mom and a, um, and a successful uh, EMDR therapist. So let's move to number two, to phase two. This is just a quick example of um, one of the many different um, um, grounding exercises that we do. And this is just um, imagery, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And we incorporate slow, short sets of bilateral. Let's now move into it. developing a calm or relaxing a soothing place. So I'd like you to think of some place you've been or imagine being that feels very calm or soothing. Perhaps being on the beach or sitting in the mountain stream. Where would you be? Um, a cove. Okay. And as you think of that cove, notice what you see and hear and feel right now. And what are you noticing? Uh, it's, it's not a big cove. Uh, it's not that small either. It's got soft breezes. Very peaceful. Okay. So focus on that, the sights and the sounds, the smells and the body sensations. Uh, you uh, tell me any more that you're noticing about it. Um, the rhythm of the, the waves is lapping on it. It's fairly protected, so it's not a big surf. Okay. All right, so just bring up the whole concept of that place, the cove, and concentrate on the, the feelings you have and the pleasant sensations in the body, and you allow, you allow yourself to kind of enjoy them for a moment. Okay, so while she's in that experience, we're well, hi, Justine. Nice on. to see you again. We're using hi. slow, yeah. short sets of bilateral to enhance or strengthen, and so that's um, uh, calming the central nervous system. It's soothing. It's strengthening, and so we spend a decent amount of time, especially in our trainings working on phase two, because the key to phase two is not that you're a great therapist and you're gonna teach your client all these state shift skills, it's can the client do them? Because if the client can do them, then they are appropriate and ready for EMDR. But if you can't get them to create imagery or if you can't get them to use a breathing strategy or you can't get them to secure their space, then you've got some work to do with them because they're not ready. So we use phase two as a way to um, assess if our clients are appropriate for EMDR, as well as giving them the skills. And in my um, uh, intake, on my consent that they sign, I'm specific to phase two, how it's really important that we hone in on phase two first. And once they get through phase two, then we've got the, the go ahead, the green light to continue with our other phases. Okay, phase three is access and activate. Well, hi, Justine. Nice to see you again. Hi. And um, we've talked a little bit about doing some EMDR today. And today we decided to work on this incident that we developed in history 
that linked back to um, a touchstone event, which was you're being tied up uh, by your brother on the dock. Uh, now, does that still seem to fit for you? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And so, what represents the worst part of that incident? Um, when I realized that they had really gotten the hog tying well, and I could leave a lot of it, and the spider was on the twig right in front of the face. Okay, okay. And what words go best with that, that represent your negative belief about yourself now? I'm totally helpless. Okay. And when you bring up that, uh, that incident, what would you like to believe about yourself now? That I could be empowered to cope with it. Okay. When you think about that incident, how true to those words, I'm empowered to cope with it, uh, feel to you now on a scale from one to seven, where one feels totally false, and seven feels totally true. Five, five, six, five. In your head or in your gut? Bring up the incident, I'm empowered, and where do you, in, in your gut? Gut two, at five. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, this is about a two. Okay, okay. And when you bring up that, and those negative words of I'm, I'm totally helpless, what emotions are you feeling right now? Terror, fear, terror. Okay. Sadness too. Okay. Some sadness to it. All right. And on a scale from zero to ten, where zero is no disturbance or neutral, and ten is the highest disturbance you can imagine, how disturbing is the instant to you now? Six. And where do you feel that in your body? Sort of like a tension in the middle section. Okay. Okay. So that was um, setting up the work. You cannot do EMDR unless you can activate the target memory. So this is Jocelyn saying, I want to work on my earliest memory. The hardest part was when they um, had her tied tight um, and she had a body sensation in her gut, which is part of the work. And now we're going to go into the phase four, which is the bilateral. And what I want you to watch or listen to really is how Jocelyn moves through the, the story because she's distressed. And the EMDR, the bilateral, um, the eye movements, desensitize her, and she starts to shift into positive language. She has a shift where she goes from being um, helpless to being empowered. And I want you to notice that shift because when she's empowered and then Roy continues with the eye movements, that's when the rewriting is happening. That's when that new encoding is happening. So we can see it happening even though it's the brain that's doing the work, okay? See how excited I get about this? Let's see here, let's move to the next one. So I'd like you to bring up that picture and those negative words, I'm totally helpless. And notice where you're feeling that in your body and just follow the picture. Okay, take a breath, let it go. What are you noticing now? I noticed the fear grew. Okay, start with that. Take a breath, let it go. And what are you noticing now? Starting to get some anger at him. Okay, deal with that. Breath, let it go. What are you noticing now? A lot of anger, and I didn't I never remembered I screamed before. I was yelling at him. I was really yelling at him. Start with that. Um, I, I remember I was still feeling helpless, but then I decided what I was going to do. I think I gave a second thought to it. And then, because I knew I was a good swimmer, and because I'd been walking the edge of the lake, I rolled off the dock. Okay, start with that. Take a breath, let it go. What's coming up now? I remember the panic on his face as I had gotten sort of like a position where my head could be up because I could float well. Yeah. That was yeah. that was sort of I was staying on that and that's that. Okay. So like that. Your breath, let it go. What are you noticing now? Um, my other brother was there. I think I told you that in history. Um I don't know what I thought, I can't remember that, but it would be sort of like probably a gotcha, and then they both had to jump off the dock to get me. 
Okay. <laughs> okay, go with start with that. There you go. What do you know to see now? Um I was aware of I realized I probably wasn't as helpless as I felt in the beginning. Okay, go with that. Right, what do you call? It's coming up now. It's just like, that I like the thought of choices looking at it, solution to what can I do? Okay. And when you go back to the original incident, what are you noticing now? It's kind of cool. It's a bowl of But that's what I focus on, not what that feeling had been on the dock, it's more what I did. Yeah. You know. When you go back to the original incident now, a scale from zero to ten, where zero is no disturbance and ten is the highest you can imagine. You're right. Zero. Okay, so these videos are for training purposes, and she's a therapist, just like the majority of people in our um, videos, because we're teaching this to you. Um, but the, the situations are authentic, and so you saw her go from being in, um, helpless with that memory to the shift to um, less dysregulation, uh, and then being able to embrace where she felt empowered. And so this next phase is where we, like I said, are rewriting the code now. Very short. Okay. So when you think about the original incident and the cause of cognition of uh, I'm empowered, does that still fit or is there a better, more positive experience? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like you to do is hold the original incident with that positive cognition of I'm empowered and on a scale from one to seven, where one is totally false and seven is totally true. How does that statement feel? Seven. Okay. Start with that. Okay. And again, can you hold that original incident with the positive cognition, one seven? Seven. Okay. Okay, so this is where the memory reconsolidation is happening. The rewriting, the rewriting of the encoding. Um, also, this is a trait change and not a state change. A state change is when my client is dysregulated and I do breathing and grounding and they calm down or they pull up a cognition to assist them with making making a choice or to amend an emotion. What we're doing here is this is permanent. Um, and it's getting in there and pulling, we pulled from the unconscious into conscious awareness, what the target was. And then we went in and we used the natural healing process of the brain to desensitize. There was that shift in the brain. And then we went in there and we used the memory reconsolidation to rewrite and save as into the uh, to the client's perspective. So now we're gonna go in and just honor the body. And this would make more sense with more training, but just it's it's a phase, which I appreciate. Okay, so now hold that original incident with the positive cognition of empowered. To close your eyes, just kind of scan down through your body and just notice any place that you might feel any distress. Just a little travel soreness. But. Okay, we're, okay, we'll focus on wherever that travel soreness is. Just go ahead and focus on it. And now try to close your eyes, focus on that experience, the positive cognition, scan down your body. What are you noticing now? Any place you're feeling anything or? Not really. Okay, just one more set. Just activating that natural healing. Right. Okay. So um, uh, we're gonna go in phase seven and phase eight. Phase seven is a closure phase that we do at the end of every session. And all it is, is um, I, I don't know if he says anything about dreams, but we find that our clients dream more and have more memories around dreams uh, with when we're doing uh, EMDR with them. Um, we tell them that processing can continue because it can if they're getting REM sleep, which means there can be new memories. It means that they could be feeling better. It means that they could be feeling worse. So um, we need to uh, just give them a heads up. And then we also will... Um, close them up with some type of uh, breathing or grounding.
So, you know, you've done some really good work today. And if you had to kind of look back at it on the experience, what kind of any, any new insights or thoughts that kind of have come with what, what you've done? Any connections you made? Yeah, the connections of the whole thing has been really blown me away a bit. And uh, then how I, my mind just went to connecting, you know, to the later things. And then that, that one thing could be, what can I do is such an empowering statement, even if you don't have the answer right away, just getting the answers can be empowering. Or even asking okay. the question. That was, that was great. And today, may continue after the session. You may or may not have new insights, thoughts, memories, or dreams. Okay. It's and then um, we did, let's see here, I want to look to see, I think I'm going to, go. the last phase is reevaluation. Um, let me just look at something real quick. Yeah, we'll watch this one too. So, uh, hi, Jocelyn, how are you today? Good. Okay, I, I, you know, we worked a little bit yesterday, uh, last time we met on reprocessing an event, and I'd just like to get an idea if there's anything that you've noticed between uh, the last session and, and uh, when we're meeting now. And it comes up. Um, just I, I've, the connection of all of the the events we talked about has really stayed with me in a positive way. Okay. Okay. And any other thoughts about being overwhelmed or helpless or powerless that uh, have a little different perspective now? Because that was sort of your theme. Um. Yeah. I I found myself thinking, you know, why do you ever feel helpless? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's okay. just be in action mode all the time. Okay, so it's sort of some other connections. Yeah. That we're yeah. Do you have any dreams or, or new thoughts or insights besides that? No. no okay. I'm passed out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and so no other no other physical sensations. No. It seems like everything was pretty much other memories related to the events that came up. No, that I remember. Okay. And he changed in your behavior other than just the concept of being in action um, mode? Yeah. I, I think one thing that when I went to bed, I was aware of the fact when you had said we were changing the time, um, you know, I thought, oh, I'm going to have so much time to kill and at the <laughs> airports getting back to Boston. Thought, I'm going to get back earlier. And I think I would have just sat there and said, you got your tickets, you're going to do it. And I called and okay. I actually ended up being able to change my flight and get back at 9.15 versus 12.30 at night. Oh, and okay. I don't think I ever would have done it. I really don't <laughs> think I would have sat there and done oh, got these flights. Okay. Okay. So, so this is an example of how we integrate the work. So when you have... Um, a sense of being empowered. Yeah, so when you have uh, the, all of the phases done, what we're hoping for is that the client is got a new perspective. You know, we rewrote and we erased some of the um, old emotional learning, and we have rewritten some new emotional learning that's more updated. Remember the five-year-old versus the twenty-five-year-old. And now, what we're thinking is that um, we would be able to um, work with the client around maybe um, you know uh, self-care and boundaries or assertiveness training or um, anger management, et cetera, et cetera, because of their shift in perspective. Um, the trainings that we do have 50 videos. So we have a hear it, see it, do it approach. And we also have 10 hours of practicum so that for five hours, you're a therapist and you are um, a client. And so we go through the eight phases. First, we teach them kind of like what I'm doing right here. Then we open them up and we learn each phase one at a time and then you get to be the therapist and you get to be the client for um, each one of the phases the first three days um, training is basically just learning the tools and then the second three days is applying it to complex clients um, because at the end of the day the, as we get into the more complex um, trauma uh, it gets a little bit more complicated than you know, some of these videos that make it look really easy. So before I um, kind of wrap up with uh, two more objectives that I haven't hit yet, are there any questions? I know there's, uh, there's a Q&A and there is a chat. Is there anything that um, is pressing before I continue? Uh, not seeing anything now. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Robert. Sure. It's nice having you there, Robert, because you're really the only person I can see. <laughs> <laughs> Same here. You're grounding me. You're part of my secure my space, <laughs> Robert. Good to know. <laughs> is that your screensaver or is that your your place? Uh, that's my screensaver. My office, though. So. Oh, okay. My clients <laughs> that get homesick. Gotcha. 
Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, right. Okay. So moving on, uh, just like I said, I just want to hit some of the objectives that I would said I would talk about. How do we know if a client is appropriate for EMDR? Well, I'm EMDR Chicago. So one of the things that comes in my door is, oh, I want EMDR. All my clients want EMDR. And because EMDR is eight phases, we can actually do quite a few of the phases without necessarily going in and doing um, the phase four, which is the work uh, that involves the eye movements. Um, one of the things that we've learned in the research is the longer the eye movements, the uh, more tra uh, trauma memories that you're going to be working with. So we can, um, it's kind of like an electric screwdriver um, in that you can uh, go at a very slow speed, even though it has nothing to do with speed, or you can move it into more intense or into a high gear. And we do that with the a number of eye movements that we do. So when we saw the video of um, the young woman with the CID, those were very short bursts of eye movements. And that, was, that would be what we would use with a client that would be more dysregulated and have more of a CPTSD, complex um, PTSD background. So um, we are gonna establish that therapeutic relationship while doing the biopsychosocial spiritual intake. Um, and that at the end of the day, this is the key, right? I mean, if we're not, if we're not a good fit, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, Alan Shore says that nonverbal trauma needs to be worked with um, nonverbally. And Daniel Siegel tells us that 85% of our communication is body language. So we really learn to work with our bodies. Um, it's something that was completely new for me uh, because I'm just really good at talking. So um, we do a lot of in the training with right brain to right brain communication and kind of honing in on like body cues and how we can read and hold and nurture and work on that attachment repair non-verbally. And then we educate the client with the treatment interventions because knowledge is power. And we empower our clients so that they understand what the treatment plan looks like. That treatment plan that you saw in the phase one is something I literally put up on a whiteboard so that I can go over with the client what the treatment plan is going to look like. They can take a picture of it. They can bring it to their group. They can bring it to their higher level of care. They can bring it to their sponsor. They can do with it whatever they want. They can hang it in their bathroom. And then, um, you know, contracting with the client so that I'm getting consent to work with um, some, you know, the trauma that either they're coming into work on, you know, my favorite situation is when a talk therapist sends a client here to work on trauma, but the therapist, but the client isn't necessarily okay with working on the trauma. So, you know, we always work it out because of the, the tool, the strategies that we use, we can target something today that will assist with the tar the trauma of the past. So there's no worries there but it's about getting that contract in place and empowering the client with the knowledge. And then this is just Alan Shore and Daniel Siegel having some fun. Uh, left brain is language, logic, lists, and the right brain. Uh, we do some videos with Daniel Siegel in the training. Right brain is gonna be that experiential. It's gonna be that imagery. It's gonna be the limbic system. It's gonna be motivation. And then we get into this polyvagal piece, which is fascinating um, with Stephen Porges. Once again, my, my website is basically geared toward helping trainees. Um, under my resources, there is a polyvagal section. There's a 30 minute video done by Stephen Porges' son. His name is Seth and he's a comedian and he does a fantastic job. You can learn polyvagal in 30 minutes and actually enjoy yourself. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's the polyvagal right there. Like I said, not anything that we could, that, that could be a whole two hour thing in itself. Um, oh, do we have time to do Daniel's uh, video here? I, okay, got to honor Daniel Siegel. Here we go. Already, but it's going to continue to come up tonight is this word integration. Yes. So what is it and why do we want it? And what do we look like when we have it? You can come up with a proposal that health and well-being are based in a fundamental shared mechanism called integration. Integration is where you have separate aspects of the system. Let's say the system of the stage is Maria, there's me. For us to be integrated, we have to do two things. We have to differentiate from each other. That is Maria as a unit of the system. It's gonna become specialized, different. She has a different history, a different thing she does. She has different talents, different abilities, different knowledge from me 
and I differentiate from hers. And so the first step is we honor each other's differences. But to be an integrated system here on the stage, we have to then link with each other in communication that's compassionate and kind and caring. So for a relationship that's integrated, you have what's called integrative communication, which is basically, by the way, a summary of the entire field of attachment research in one sentence. Secure attachment is based on integrative communication, honoring differences, promoting linkages. That's the whole thing, whether your kid is a baby or a teenager or an adult at home. Okay, so, so that's about relationships. In the body, you can look at the same thing. When the nervous system, for example, is integrated, you have the left and right different from each other, but then they're linked. So, so here's what I need to realize, that communication is all about how you send energy and information to someone. Always. That's all communication is. So I know I need my relationship, which is basically based on my communication. And that's going to affect... Yeah. So here's the, here's the story. How I communicate with my daughter is going to go in through... How is, how is Maria, my daughter, going to get the energy I sent to her? Her senses. Her senses. She will see me. She will hear me. If I'm touching her, she'll feel me. She can smell me. She can taste me. All these things. All the five senses, right? So energy and information literally are received by the senses. I know that the feeling of connectedness, of relatedness, has a dominance actually in her right hemisphere. And the signals that come up from her body, which include the signals from her heart, where we do literally have a, a brain around the heart. How don't you know that? You have a heart brain as well as an intestinal brain. And that is in part what processes our sense of rejection. And it's going to go up into her right brain, this right brain, over here. And I know that the, the experience she's having now is she's being flooded with a sense of rejection, which is right dominant, a feeling in her body of sadness, right dominant. And all that stuff is a raw right hemisphere response. If you want to call it an emotional response, that's fine. There's emotions on both sides of the brain. My key is to connect with Maria. Now, because I'm an adult and I've passed through the school system, I have a hugely developed left hemisphere. <laughs> it's just true. And the, the way to remember the left is there are all these L's. It's later to develop, whereas the right is... Really slow to develop. Earlier. <laughs> the right is earlier. <laughs> Okay, the left is linear, so the right is holistic. The left is logical, meaning it does what's called syllogistic reasoning, look for cause-effect relationships, solving problems. The right just takes in things as they are, so some people would say it's visual-spatial, just the impressions of how things are. The left loves making lists, like this list I'm making right now. And the right instead is all about autobiographical memory, it's about stress reduction, and it had, actually is the only mm -hmm. side of the brain that has an integrated map of the whole body. Yep. Only the right side of the brain. Now, the left also is specialized in linguistics. Language with words, dominant. There's language on both sides, but it's dominant on the left. The right, in contrast, is nonverbal signals. So it's eye contact, facial expression, tone of voice, posture, gestures, Timing and intensity of response. And I want hey, we're you to all do, gonna do it together. Ready? So I get everybody oh, yeah, moving. Right. Come on, come on, we'll do it together. I'll eye show contact. Them how the eye contact. Eye contact. Eye contact. Eye contact. Facial expression. Tone of voice. Tone of voice. Posture. Posture. Gesture. Gesture. Timing. Intensity. 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 Response. Let's do it together. I'm not going to say it this time. Okay. I'm going to point so it out. What point. I love about Daniel Siegel is he's talking about right brain to right brain. And when you think about doing the bilateral crossing that midpoint and activating the corpus callosum, which then into, um, uh, in, um, I'm sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? It activates the right brain into the work, which is connected to the body, which is 80, picks up on 85% of the communication, which is nonverbal. We're missing out on all of this with just a talk therapy session. So that's my point. Um, and so I'm going to kind of, I want to leave a Q and A. I want to honor the dissociative experiences scale because we do do a big section on dissociation. If you are one that um, 
uh, Chexford Association. The screening tool on my website is um, uh, awesome. It's a color-coded one and it helps the therapist learn about dissociation. And then there is, I'm gonna skip forward because of time. Um, oh, I do love this video though. We work with kids, just had to do it. Breathe. Sometimes the monster that's inside you is a monster that is mad. It's a monster who is angry. It's a monster who feels bad. When your monster wants to throw things and your monster wants to shout, there's a way to calm your monster and chill your inner monster out. So we do a lot of work with kids. Um, we look to do with uh, 10 minutes of eye movements per session, and it's very powerful. So I'm going to end here. And uh, there, wait, there's one more slide, though, that answers questions. I'd thrown on a, there it is. Um, what additional populations can we work with? Uh, we go through all of these in our training, um, couples, dissociation, uh, self-use, which is interesting, addiction, um, recent events, grief, children, phobia, anxiety, OCD, you name it, it can be applied because everything has a root cause. So I'm going to wrap up here um, uh, and just see if there's any questions. Um, Robert, if you could just put, once again, you can always reach me at emdrchicago at gmail.com or P. Marucci, my uh, website is EMDR Chicago. Like I said, there are resources on there. There's access to all my coaches, including Robert, if you wanna reach out to him. Um, my trainings are on there. Um, I've got one coming up in Gurney and I'm doing a uh, virtual training. And um, the prices are about as low as they've ever been. And like I said, I don't know if the virtuals are gonna continue after this year, we're hoping so. And there was one other thing I was gonna say about the trainings. Um, I forgot what it was. So yeah, if so questions. I can't, I wish I could see you guys, but because usually I can tell like if this was engaging or not. Uh, because in my trainings I can see everybody. Yeah, I also gave them the EMDR consulting website if they're interested in seeing okay, the yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So any thoughts, any feedback on the presentation? Like uh, some positive comments about the information, loving it and Mm -hmm. Just know um, we, we've got a lot of interns that are doing it at the end of their um, pr uh, their internships because they're working with clients because getting that trauma 101 piece is really important as you graduate from school, especially uh, after the pandemic. Yeah, what, we get a lot of comments like people say once you once you see trauma, you can't unsee it. And the cool thing is that once you, you unsee it, this therapy provides the ability to actually treat it. It makes you feel more empowered because you have an understanding of it. So, what are your thoughts, Ryan? It was wonderful. I think it was great. I have had a couple emails and texts already asking for a part two. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just so put that on our radar. <laughs> yeah, Ryan's got a lifetime membership with EMTR Chicago. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you so much. I don't know if there's any, just tons, like Robert said, just tons of positive. Um, oh, uh, someone had asked, um, would love to know more about EMDR with borderline personality disorder. Yes, personality disorder. So the DES, which is the, um, you can go on my website and I've got the tools that you use. Um, we would do a mid-analysis, which is the multi um, inventory of dissociation, and we would work from the stage per, uh, perspective before we would go in and be doing any uh, EMDR. And then as an advanced training, which I'm facilitating in June, uh, we have um, structural dissociation, ego states, and EMDR. And you, so you wouldn't work with that client until after you've done the basic training and done the advanced training. 
and it's great. It's great work. Yeah, someone had asked about you using it in a high school setting. They yeah. aren't allowed to even be trained, they said. Mm -hmm. And we have so, a lot of high school social workers that are getting trained right now. Yeah, they're saying that some high schools won't even allow it, even if it's trained. And I think yeah. that's bringing Paula to the, those communities in high school, like, let us know, because they just need to be educated about it, especially the way we provide that, as Paula said. these. Yeah, yeah. it's like getting vaccinated, you know, it depends on what state you're in. Uh, some schools are really embracing it right now. Um, you can, the CID and ATIP that we saw the critical incident desensitization, once you're trained, um, you can actually train paraprofessionals uh, and paraprofessionals read from a script and they can do CID and ATIP, which is desensitizing for, um, you know, for our little ones, for high school kids. It's, it's insane what you can do with it. But yeah, you're right. It's, uh, you know, I've got higher levels of care around here that refuse to use EMDR and they're, they're treatment centers. And I, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you because if you do the, if you look at the research, um, yeah, sure. 10, 15 years ago, even Robert and I were scared to use the tool. Um, but what's going on now, I, everybody's, you know, should be trained just to have it in their toolbox. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I can't even say enough about the addiction work. Can't, I mean, I go nuts in my training on the addiction piece. But one question is how much direct work is done to help clients with other interpersonal issues, probably linked to an earlier trauma? Well, this is going to directly work with it. It's mm -hmm. going to recode, rewrite uh, how clients look at relationships. They need to grieve what they didn't get. And they need, it's shifting from an external locus of control where everything that you uh, feel and think is about the external environment to an internal locus of control where you're pulling from an eye perspective and getting my own needs met, which a lot of our clients haven't been able to do because they didn't get appropriate, you know, good enough uh, parenting. Right. So such a high percentage, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of what we see is relational traumas. Mm -hmm. it, it says, is one fully trained to use EMDR after the first two weekends? And uh, 10 hours of free consultation, yes. And you get the consultation with us. It's part of the package, yeah. It's part, yeah. yeah, it's part of the package. We just, we make sure that you get where you need to be. And then if you want to stick around with us, uh, we hang out for a lifetime. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody just commented, it'd be great to use it at therapeutic day school for the yep. kids with trauma, elementary. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, well, my goal is that you leave here knowing what EMDR is. So if everybody could chat bomb Robert, uh, if thumbs up if uh, or yes, if you know what EMDR is now, if you pulled away from this two hours, what EMDR is and how it works. Because that is the mystery. And then you can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I post a lot as Ryan knows um, <laughs> about EMDR and other related topics. Yeah, much better understanding now. Good. That's the key. Mm -hmm. Yep. Someone had raised a hand um, looking for them. I believe it was um, Stephanie. Oh, that was earlier, but um, yeah. It must have went down right away. I don't see it. Okay. 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 Okay, are we good? Yes, well, thank Thanks you. So. I just want to thank all of you for, um, you know, time is, time is money, time is, is uh, hard to come by and for spending these two hours with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. All right. Thank you. Everybody enjoy the rest of their week. Take care.